Over the last couple of lectures, we've seen a variety of inorganic crystal structures. What we've seen so far is just barely scratching the surface of the wide variety of inorganic crystal structures that exist. But the structures that do exist are not just random. Right? There is some logic to when we see certain crystal structures. And a big part of that comes back to the stoichiometry. For example, consider these four compounds and their crystal structures shown here. All four are metal oxides, and in each case the building unit is a metal centered octahedron. But yet you can see that we've got four very different crystal structures for these four compounds. And the reason why we see this variety is in part because all four compounds have a different stoichiometry, a different empirical formula. And so in this lecture, we're going to look at the links, such as they are, between the empirical formula of a compound and its crystal structure. So let's start by writing what's called the crystal chemical formula for a polar covalent compound. Um, we're going to call the more electropositive atom the cation C, and the more electronegative atom the anion a. But it doesn't make that much difference how large the difference in electronegativity is. Yes, this works for compounds that are highly ionic, but we'll see it also works for compounds that have considerable covalency. One of the things we know is that we must maintain a charge balance. So however many cations there are in the empirical formula, here small m, times the charge of the cation, must be balanced by the number of anions in the empirical formula times the charge of the anion. And here we can also feel free to use oxidation numbers just as easily as we would use true charges. All right, so this is something that actually almost every freshman chemistry student knows. Something that you may not have thought about is there's also what's called a connectivity balance. So in these crystal chemical formulas, we're going to use this superscripted number here in square brackets, this capital N, to represent the coordination number of atom C. And the coordination number of atom A is capital M. So the number of cations in the empirical formula times its coordination number must be equal to the number of anions in the empirical formula times its coordination number. And then the last balance that we want to look at is what's called the bond valence balance. Now, in some ways, we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. We're going to talk about bond valences in some detail in Chapter 5. But for now, think about this as something like a bond order. And in these inorganic compounds, we're going to calculate the bond order by taking the oxidation number and divided by the coordination number. And the bonds that go to the cation are the same bonds that come from the anion. So they have to be equivalent. So we could alternatively have calculated the bond order by taking the oxidation number of the anion divided by the coordination number of the anion. Let's do an example. All right, let's do a simple one. We're going to look at the binary compound that forms between silicon and oxygen. Um, we also are going to make use of the fact that silicon has a strong preference for tetrahedral coordination. And so in combination with oxygen, that is almost always what is seen. So knowing that, can we figure out the empirical formula of this compound? Can we figure out the coordination number of oxygen? And what about the bond order or the valence of the bonds between silicon and oxygen? So here's our crystal chemical formula. I've put in a couple of pieces of information. We know the silicon is 4 plus oxidation state. We know the oxygen has got a 2 minus oxidation state. Per the information given here, I've set the silicon coordination number at 4. Now, with that, I've got all that I need to answer all of these questions. So the electroneutrality balance tells us that whatever the ratio m to n, of silicon to oxygen, we have to have twice as much oxygen in order to have electroneutrality balance. 
And so this tells us that the empirical formula must be SiO2. The conductivity balance tells us that if there's one silicon in the empirical formula and it makes four bonds, then because there are two oxygens, the coordination number of oxygen must be two. Right? So we might think oxygen could be uh, linear or maybe a bent coordination. And then finally, if we look at the bond valence balance, whether we take the silicon and say that there's oxidation number four spread over four bonds, or the oxygen, oxidation number two spread over two bonds, in either case we get a bond valence of one per bond. I find it a little bit easier to do some of this just with a simple drawing, which is called a bond graph. Let's look at the bond graph for SiO2. It looks something like this. You can draw it in multiple ways, but first rule is that every atom in the empirical formula goes into the bond graph. So our empirical formula is SiO2, so our bond graph has one silicon and two oxygens. And then we're going to draw lines to represent bonds. So the silicon has a coordination number of four. So we want to have four lines emanating from the silicon. And then we're going to distribute those equally if we can. And so that means that two go to each oxygen. So what this tells us is that the silicon is four coordinate and the oxygen is two coordinate. And we could calculate a bond valence, as we did on the last slide, that would say the valence of each bond would be 1. All right, what happens if we were to go to another compound? Let's look at the compound that forms between titanium and oxygen, TiO2. Well, titanium is larger than silicon, and the dominant coordination number that you see for titanium is 6, an octahedron. So let's draw three lines from the titanium to each oxygen. Since we have six lines emanating from the titanium, then that means the titanium is going to be six coordinate. And then each oxygen has three lines coming to it, so that means each oxygen is three coordinate, as we see in the crystal chemical formula below. Now, one of the things that I don't want you to get confused with is you know, drawing two bonds does not mean a double bond. SiO is not a double bond. The TiO is not a triple bond. That's just a symbolism that we use to determine the coordination number. In fact, if we were to calculate the strength of each bond in TiO2, we would come up with a valence of two-thirds. Another thing then to remember is that the valences we find in these inorganic compounds don't need to be integers. Right? So This is not like an organic molecule where carbon has to make four bonds and has a valence of four. Here, the valence can be a fraction. What about calcium fluoride, CaF2? Well, calcium is bigger still, and a common coordination number we might find for calcium would be 8. And so if the calcium is 8 coordinate, it tells us that the fluorine must be 4 coordinate. And in the last lecture, I believe, we talked about the structure of calcium fluoride, where we have tetrahedral fluoride and eight fluorides around each calcium in a cube. Okay, another thing to keep in mind is the role of symmetry. And by symmetry, I don't necessarily mean all of the symmetry we've been talking about in this class, but here are two expressions of what I am trying to talk about. One of them comes from Linus Pauling in a paper he wrote uh, circa 1930 about rules for understanding ionic compounds. And in that, one of Pauling's rules is the rule of parsimony. And the rule of parsimony tells us that if we have a given ion in a crystal, we should have as few number of coordination environments for that ion as possible. Ideally, every ion of a given type in a crystal structure will have the same environment. A more modern interpretation of this rule comes from David Brown, who did a lot of important work on bond valences that we'll see in chapter 5. Uh, Brown calls it the rule of maximum symmetry, and he says that the most stable structure is the one that will have the most symmetry consistent with the constraints acting on the system. 
And what does he mean by that? Well, that comes back to consistent with the kind of constraints that stoichiometry is going to put on the crystal. We're going to always try and follow these rules when we can, although we will see that there are frequent violations from them. All right, so now I'd like you to think about something. Here are two compounds, aluminum oxide and sodium nitride. What can you tell me about their crystal structures from these balances we've been talking about? And let's assume that in both crystal structures, the rule of parsimony is obeyed. I'm going to pause the video. I want you to approach this in whatever way you feel best. You can use the equations we started with, or you can use the bond graph. But tell me about the coordination numbers and the empirical formulas of the ions involved in both of these compounds. All right, well, let's start with aluminum oxide. What do we know? Well, we know that aluminum is a plus 3 ion, and oxygen is normally minus 2. And so to meet the electroneutrality balance, we need three oxygens and two aluminums. So my bond graph is going to have exactly that. Now, the next thing is I need to make some kind of assumption for the coordination number of one of these ions. And probably it's best to start with aluminum. In oxides, aluminum is normally found either in a tetrahedron or an octahedron. Well, we don't know a priori which one it's going to be, but let's say that it's a tetrahedron. So let's try and complete our bond graph. So we could say that that aluminum atom is going to make four bonds to oxygen, and the other aluminum will make four bonds to oxygen. And then when we look at it, we see that two of the oxygens are making three bonds to aluminum, and one oxygen is making only two bonds. So we have violated Pauling's rule of parsimony here. We have two chemically different oxygens. If we can avoid that, we want to avoid that. So we're going to say, all right, this is probably not the right structure. Let's try again, and this time let's assume the aluminum is in octahedral coordination. So if we make six bonds from the first aluminum to oxygen, and then six bonds from the right-hand side aluminum to oxygen, we get this bond graph. And this looks better, because now we see each of the two aluminums is six-coordinate, and each of the three oxygens is four-coordinate. So we could write the crystal chemical formula like this. I didn't ask you to do it, but we could go on and calculate the bond valence, and we would see that each of those bonds has a valence of a half. What about sodium nitride? Well, nitride has a minus 3 charge, and sodium is plus 1. And so this would be the atoms in our bond graph. And now uh, we just have to make some assumptions about the coordination number. Normally, you know, nitrogen coordination number is oftentimes four or six. Uh, it would be pretty rare to have coordination number bigger than six. Sodium is oftentimes, you know, rather large. It's kind of a large cation, so sodium might be anywhere from six to 12. Let's assume a coordination number of six for nitrogen. That's about as large as you would typically find. And if we do that, we find that the coordination number at sodium must be 2. And so our crystal chemical formula would be Na3N with sodium being 2-coordinate and nitrogen being 6-coordinate. And here, the valence of each bond is going to be also a half. Now, the interesting thing about sodium nitride you might think, okay, all the binary compounds were found a long time ago. But it turns out sodium nitride was only discovered in 2002. Right? So less than 20 years ago was the first time anyone prepared sodium nitride. Normally, when you try and make a reaction between sodium and nitrogen, the compound you might get would be sodium azide. And now we can kind of understand why it is so difficult to make sodium nitride. 
because the sodium has to have a coordination number that is very, very small for sodium. I mean, have you ever heard of sodium being in a linear coordination? Normally, you would expect, like it is in rock salt, to be six coordinate, there's sodium that's eight coordinate, nine coordinate, up to 12 coordinate. So these things are seen, but two coordinate is an extreme outlier. And that's what makes it so hard to make this compound. If you do make the compound, it actually decomposes at about 360 degrees Kelvin. 